Alright, should be live now. Hello, fellas. Uh, today we're going to be doing a stream in response to a video that my fiance uh, is actually interested in having responded to by this guy called Forrest Valkai on, um, on gender identity. Before we get into this video, first of all, uh, type 1 to let me know that you can hear me. Uh, second of all, uh, before I get into that, I'd also like to say the fellow in this video is very evidently angry and I understand that anger has a way of conveying um, conveying that emotion over to people who are opposing them and I understand that my audience is people who are going to be very very much opposed to what Forrest has to say but the way I see it is that if we're going to have a debate with this fella um, because I can see a situation where he actually sees this uh, because uh, I know that Ocean Keltoy has seen at least one of my videos, and so I know that it's reaching people regardless, or even a higher sub count. I think that it's necessary that we are calm in our response to this, even if the guy is in such a mood as to provoke us to anger, first of all. And uh, second of all, as always... Um, if there are insults or anything directed towards the guy I'm responding to in the chat, any sort of rudeness in his direction, um, aside from towards his actual point of view, like not not in terms of any sort, no personal features, nothing that he's doing should be mocked. At worst, his ideas. Any of that, I will immediately just block messages as I do with other streams. So I just want to make that clear. This is going to be civil. Even though there's every temptation from every side for this not to be, because it's a very significant, uh, it's a very significant and sensitive political issue that we're, that we're going to be discussing here. Uh, that's gender ideology, as I've said, and there are, regardless of um, what Forrest Valkyrie might think in this video, there are quite serious ramifications um, dependent on which side we pick as a society on this thing. So before we start. Okay, Patroclus has clicked one. Okay, so YouTube is not receiving enough video to maintain smooth streaming. I apologize, fellas, if it's a little slow. I don't know why it's going on. Like Probably uh, other people on the Wi-Fi playing video or something. So we'll try our best. Okay, so with that said, there are eight of you guys. And I expect the eight of you to, uh, you know, actually provide running commentary with me. Uh, because this is something that is quite important. I've just remembered I have to put my headphones in as well um, before I start. This is probably... This might actually cause issues. So, uh, hopefully this doesn't cause issues, but in on the off chance that it does, we might have to change something. Okay. That was a silly oversight. <laughs> I will. Okay, so Tozo. Okay, it's going through that. So, please press 1 if you can hear the guy. Okay, so his name is Forrest. Please let me know if you can hear it. I'm taking it that you fellas could probably hear it. I'm not seeing any responses in the chat. Uh, actually, you know what? I can just check on my end. No, you you can't hear it. That's that's really dumb. Um, right. So it should be going through the. Okay, let's try that. Weird that I could make a bunch. Wow, this is really cringe. <laughs> In the meantime, if anybody's got any questions, please add them. Oh, hi there. I wasn't actually reading this. My name's... Okay, so let's let's try on my end again. Oh. Um. Right. So it should be going through... This is why you start with your headphones in the beginning of the stream. <laughs> Weird that I could make a bunch... There we go. Okay, that, that made the difference. I can see now on my end. So we'll just continue with it. Um, he actually... He... I mean... 
you know, we'll just let him go ahead with this because, to be honest, I, I think that the guy completely obliterates his own point within the first two and a half minutes of him making this video. Um, he, he actually, he, he puts himself in a really awful position. And this is why the video is partly titled Why, why Scientists Shouldn't Try to Be Philosophers. Because the guy makes a comment. You know, we'll just get on to it. Forest. I'm a biologist and I make we'll educational science videos on the internet. Not too long ago, I made a TikTok video about what it means to be trans or intersex. We'll and ever since that day, I've been tagged in about a thousand different videos of people making the same stupid arguments that we've all heard a million times. Things like, oh, you're either XX or XY, or boys act like this and girls look like that, or you can't change your gender any more than you can change your age or your species. And I figured that I could make a bunch of different TikTok videos, each one trying to cram into 60 seconds just how asinine these arguments actually are, or I could just make one solid YouTube video that explains in layman's terms how this whole two gender system works, or doesn't work from a biological perspective. Before we begin, however, we're gonna need to get a few things straight. First of all, humans are animals. We are living things, and we are not plants, and we are not fungi, and we are not bacteria. We are animals, and we obey the same laws of nature as every other animal. I'm th uh, Okay, so that's going to be important, I think, because that means that then we can start talking about biological purpose. But he gets even more explicit when he goes through his section on definitions. I'm throwing this in here right at the outset because I want to try to avoid the insane argument that we are somehow special or have some privileged place in this world. We're not. And we I mean, you're wrong on this, but I mean, that's irrelevant to, uh, to any sort of argument I'm going to be making for the rest of this video. We don't. Second of all, throughout the course of this video, I'm going to be arguing- In fact, he's actually going to make a point later on in the video that shows that we do actually have some kind of privileged position. But, uh against the binary model of things like sex and gender, but I'm still going to use terms like male and female and girl and boy. This is just for the sake of convenience. If I were to make a long-form argument like this and have special language for the whole thing, this video would be unwatchable, so I'm counting on you to be able to follow along. You're also going to need to understand some pretty basic biological terminology, so I'm going to run through a very quick vocab list for you. If you don't want to sit through that, just jump to this part of the video. But I strongly encourage that everybody stick around because this might help avoid some confusion later on. I'm going to encourage you very much not to skip this bit, because this is the point where he hangs himself. Cells are the most fundamental unit of life. In fact, they're the smallest things that we can call alive. Your body is made of lots and lots of cells of all sorts of different shapes and sizes that all do different things. DNA is the instruction manual that your body uses to do most things, mainly just making proteins. You Alright, so making proteins. This is, this is a description of what's known as an intrinsic telos or purpose, right? When we can talk of two different kinds of purposes in particular things. We can talk about the intrinsic telos, which is simply what a thing does, or we can talk of the extrinsic telos when something is pursued outside of that. So, for example, the fact that my lungs breathe, they are that's an intrinsic telos. So I breathe in and I breathe out, right? That's intrinsic telos. And then you have extrinsic telos, which is when you're reaching outside of yourself. So, for example, a person might orient themselves to follow a particular school of philosophy throughout life. So then, because we're no different from nature, and the fact that the guy speaks about brains a lot, and to be honest, I, th I suspect, this may not even be his view, but I know that it's a predominant view on the progressive left. They have this view of physicalism. So they would say that the human person has no spiritual aspect, and that they are simply completely physical. And so therefore, insofar as there are proteins present in that body, which is the entire human person, they would say, there is an intrinsic telos behind that. There is purpose imbued into every single cell of the human body. That, insofar as it's intrinsic. I'm not talking about extrinsic telos. I'm talking about intrinsic telos. And this can... In, in fact, in this case, he's described the encoding of proteins from DNA is a composed process, so there are smaller parts involved in the creation of proteins inside of cells, right? So you have the ribosome as well as the DNA and things like this, right? Now, I can't describe it in as much detail as this fella here. The guy is qualified at a university level in biology. I have an, I have a GCSE in additional science, so I'm not on the same level as him, but I was taught enough uh, in national examinations, and he indeed concedes himself, that there is such thing as int intrinsic teloi in the human body. And in his view, and to be honest, in my view as well, for different reasons, uh, he concedes that the entire human person has a purpose as a result. Because if he can concede this particular system, 
why would it not be conceded to any other system? Because obviously these proteins code for, for um, you know, different cells, and these constitute other organs, and these organs work together as systems. You know, you don't have the brain operating without the cardiovascular system operating, right? And this ends up in a, an integrated human person with different subsystems operating together. So I don't think that he would disagree with any of this, but I think that he would disagree with the conclusions that I would draw from this. You have DNA in almost every single cell in your body. A long stretch of DNA that codes for one particular thing is called a gene, and a bunch of DNA, a bunch of genes, all squished together and coiled up into a little wad is called a chromosome. Humans have 46 chromosomes that are broken up into 23 pairs. You get 23 from your dad. He does a lot of this, actually. Um, in fact, there's actually one section of the video where I sat and watched it, and I decided I'd skip about six minutes because he gets bogged down in scientific details on subsystems without acknowledging the greater problem. So, you know, for example, it's, it's actually completely irrelevant, I think, to our consideration of sex when we speak colloquially uh, whether or not we have 46 chromosomes. But we'll, we'll continue on with this. this Add 23 his... from your mom. Each pair does pretty much the same thing. By the way, fun fact, if you were to take all of the DNA out of just one of your cells, all 46 chromosomes, unwind them all and stretch them out end to end, it would be about as long as me, a little over six feet long. And that's just in one cell. Another term. And that's a lot of purpose. <laughs> The term that you're going to want to know is the term dimorphic. Di means two, morph means shape, so dimorphism is the state of having two different shapes. This is what we call it whenever a species has differently shaped males and females. And in case you want to know, the term for having males and females in the first place is called being dioecious. A monoecious species only has one sex. A dioecious species has two. This will become important later, but only for him, not for us. I'm probably going to use quite a few more terms throughout the video, but I'll try to explain those as I go along. I don't want to give you like a whole word bank here, so let's get started with the concept of what sex actually is. In biology, sex is not just the term for the act of reproduction through gene blending. It's also the term for how we characterize and categorize males versus females. And in the world of biology, your sex is determined by the size of your reproductive cells, which we call your gametes. If Well, when people... This is, this is probably where my argument basically hinges. And the reason why this is important is because, as he'll demonstrate later on, or well, not that further later on, his definition of sex is completely incoherent. The reason it's completely incoherent is that it focuses on the gametes. It focuses on the haploid cells that come out of either come out of a man in the act of sex and remain inside of a woman and, you know, are, you know I don't have to explain the intricacies, largely because they're irrelevant. You know, you have the sperm, meet the egg, and that forms a, a zygote. He'll talk about the gametes, but the problem is, is I don't think that you can possibly reduce sex to simply the size or the variations in gametes, because the entire operation of these gametes is reliant on other subsystems, and higher systems, I would say. So, for example, you have sperm, but sperm is ultimately reliant on the penis in order for sex to occur and, you know, for it to be placed in the right place. Now, you could say something like, oh, there's artificial insemination, but this is how it ordinarily goes within nature. Man has sex with woman, woman gets pregnant, right? There is a reliant... In fact, you would have to go through all kinds of weird biological trickery in order to somehow get sperm out of a man, uh without provoking the male sexual organs. So even in the case of things like IVF, there has to be triggering of the male sexual reproductive system beyond the gametes in order for this to operate. So I would say this is reductive, even just considering sex. I'm not going to touch on the biological area, although I just did. I probably shouldn't have, because I don't know. But when people typically say uh, biological definition, they're referring to something more colloquial. They're not referring to whatever a um, whatever some academic in a university is referring to. For example, right, we have references to men and women in ancient texts. Uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh has references to men and women, for example. I feel like I'm mocking the guy. I'm not intending to mock you if you're watching this. But this was many, many years before people knew what a gamete even was. 
I don't know exactly when the first time somebody decided to look at sperm in an egg under a microscope was, but I'm pretty sure that this didn't happen until at least the 17th century. And yet we could still classify men and women. And this is what people generally mean when they're referring to men and women. And so I provide a definition, a colloquial definition for this, with some rather highfalutin philosophical language, but I think that it nails down basically what we're talking about. So sex is the accidental property of human nature determining what aspect of efficient causality is carried out by the person during reproduction. That's a massive mouthful, so I'll explain it. So, first of all, I'll say accidental property. What I mean by this is that you can have a human person that isn't female um, and isn't male, right? Like, like the property of somebody's sex is not determined by the mere fact that they're human. They can be male or female. Now, of human nature, so this is the human person, the, the fact that he can talk about species, which refers to kind, refers, well, at least for a lot, at least for, okay, for a while, this would have referred to some actual kind, right? Nowadays, there's funny stuff going on with the philosophy I've heard, where they can't even decide what a species even is, but for our purposes, we know what a human is, in this case. Determining what aspect of efficient causality. So efficient causality is the act of doing something, right? So insects, you have two, you have two people working together to essentially mix their eggs, their their egg and a single sperm, or whatever variation, what have you, in order to produce a zygote or more than one zygote. I'm not. Like I say, I'm not really clear on the biological technicalities, but it's not really a, really relevant to my discussion here. It's basically what part of the sex we're doing. And this is carried out by the person during reproduction, right? So, it's evident in sex that there are men and women. You have, as he's pointed out, you have differences in the gametes in men and women. But also you have differences in all of the... In, in a number of different subsystems which help to not only enable the process of sexual reproduction but also drive the person to fulfill their aspect of efficient causality in the performance of this. So this wouldn't just extend to things like the ability to ejaculate. This would also extend towards sexual arousal. This would also extend towards um, secondary s sex characteristics. All of these systems work together in order to drive the person towards the act of reproduction. That is what I think the majority of people understand by sex, although this is admittedly a very highfalutin way of describing it. Yeah, don't don't mock the guy Gloff. Um, I will I will remove your comment. I'll give you one chance beyond this. Don't I I'd I'd perceive that as mock mockery if um, somebody saw that. I'm not going to ban you because I know that you don't mean badly, but still, I'd rather be pleasant to these people, even if we vociferously disagree. If you have lots and lots of very small little gametes, we call those sperm and you're a boy. If you have relatively few very large gametes, we call those eggs and you're a girl. Now right away, you can notice that there's a pretty big problem here. What if you don't have any gametes? What if you're infertile? Does that mean that you're neither male nor female? The thing that you have to understand about biology is that all we're trying to do is define and calculate what nature is already doing all on its own. Life... Well, I, I think that we can see that nature is intending a particular purpose in the cooperation of all these subsystems, otherwise you wouldn't have them. You wouldn't have... If, there were, if, if nature were entirely random, you wouldn't have the gametes of a man corresponding to uh, the genitals of a man. You wouldn't have all of these different systems working in tandem with one another. You know, we tend to call a person infertile when they don't have gametes. They might have the other aspects, but they lack that particular intrinsic part that enables the sex act. We would call that we would call that a um a nasty word which I'm not going to say here. If makes all the rules and breaks all the rules all the time. It's no problem, Gloff. I, I understand if you didn't here at the beginning. I want to be as um, as pleasant as possible on this stream. Although it becomes very difficult when you're talking about somebody who who doesn't seem to 
maybe follow their conclusions through 100%. So as biologists, our job is to try to just carve out a hole for the peg that nature has already given us. There is description, but there's also noting of the purpose of particular operations, as you yourself have conceded when you're describing DNA. So we should also apply this to sex. And not everybody's going to fit into that slot. The point is, the definition of sex is not unique here. There is almost always some wiggle room, some gray area, in almost every single biological definition of anything. So well, I don't, I don't know if there's a particular wiggle room in this. I would say that there would be slightly different material, uh, you know, differences between human beings that can still nonetheless fulfill that, um, that definition. You know, some people's boobs are bigger than others, some people's... Um, you know, penises are bigger than others, you know. Like, there's still variation, but there's still the operation of the system. Because, you know, these... Well, I mean, it just, just simply does. I don't, I don't need to really... I don't really need to explain it any further. It's one of the reasons I became a biologist, because life is weird as shit. So yeah, the fact that I just gave you an actual textbook definition and then immediately blew a big hole in it should give you a pretty good idea of how the rest of this video is going to go. And this is why scientists should be trained in philosophy. Ignore People have been complaining about this for at least a hundred years, by the way. I'm thinking of um, René Guénon. René Guénon, in one of his books, actually points out that even in the 1920s, there was over-specialization on the part of people in the universities, and I think that this is just a result of that. Ignoring the fact that an individual of a dioecious species might not have any gametes at all, the fact that we base sex on gamete size in the first place raises a lot of serious concerns. There are like, why did you pick that, de that definition? Several species that are dioecious, they have males and females, but their gametes are all the same size. They differentiate into what we call mating types, which you could call like male and female, but the only thing that you'd be going off of there is who's giving and who's receiving the gametes. And if we tried to define everybody that way, then things like seahorses would have their sexes swapped because the females deposit the eggs into the males, and then the males fertilize. And then, and this is going to be a, a very large um, part of this video. It's going to be pointing to other species and saying, well, they're different. Well, I mean, it doesn't matter. We're not, we're not seahorses. I, I don't understand why people continually bring this up. But, y you know, we aren't seahorses. We're not fruit flies. We're human beings. So, why bring this up? Why what? So you can show there's diversity in nature. Does that somehow mean that human nature is different as a result of that? No, of course not. It just shows that the creation, as it exists, has some variation in it. That doesn't... Like, the fact that a, that a fruit fly has a different number of chromosomes than me and has a different sexual reproductive system than me doesn't in any way indicate that I should be imitating the fly. ...eyes them and give birth to live young. Also, there are a few species that have more than just two gamete sizes. For example, there's one species of fruit fly that has one size of egg and then three different sizes of sperm each... Also, one of the things that seems to stay constant throughout this, and if I've missed something, I'm wrong and I, I apologize, but he still insists on eggs and sperm, right? They do actually have a rigid definition, right? So there is some objectivity to this, it seems produced by a different type of male. So we should really be saying that there are four different sexes here, or at the very least we could say that there's two sexes, but one of them is broken down into three subclasses of male, one of which violates the whole definition of sex anyway because... Well, I just refuse to concede your, your definition of sex. Their sperm is actually bigger than the female's egg. By the way, in case you were curious, here's some bonus vocab words for you. The term for when a species has more than one size of gamete is anisogamy. The term for having just one size of gamete is isogamy. So if you wanted to sound all smart and important, you could say that humans are a dioecious, anisogametic, and moderately sexually dimorphic species of primates. All and all of this is completely irrelevant. Also, the whole idea that you're just born male or female and that we should just go with what's on your birth certificate is deeply flawed, to say the least. There are several species that are completely hermaphroditic, making both sperm and eggs. There are several species that are... But we're human. We're human beings. We are dimorphic, as you have just said. So, of course, we should go with our birth certificates when we're considering what point of efficient causality we are going to be performing in the sex act if we choose to engage in that. 
that are sequentially hermaphroditic. They start out as either male or female, and then later on in life they switch. There are plenty of species that can be one sex their entire lives, and then when it comes time to breed, if they can't find the opposite sex around, they just switch to the opposite sex to help them. Actually, Chuchab Waifu, I'm making you a mod so that I don't have to constantly check the chat. Thanks. Everybody else out. There are even some animals that we call bilateral gonandromorphs that are literally male on one half of their body and female on the other half. You can even have that whole setup just in your gonads. Ovo testes are when you have- Actually, so this this goes on about this for a while. Um, I noted down that about 12.30 is where things start to get more interesting again. So I'm just going to skip six minutes of it because it's basically him talking about hormones and talking about chromosomes and completely missing what people mean when they say sex. When people say biological sex, they're not referring to the size of somebody's gametes. ...producing their scepters to bind testosterone. So even though they've got enough testosterone in their body to give them freaking antlers and a mane, they still look and feel like a girl. A couple of other important notes about sex chromosomes. So the context of this is that you've got, uh, I think it's differences in hormones or something like that, when it comes to a teenage girl, and this teenage girl has taken to the doctor and it's discovered that these things are variant, and therefore she was never actually a girl in the first place. Um, which I don't think follows, because evidently, based on primary and secondary sexual characteristics, such as the ones that we would use to identify the, the causality that I described earlier on, um, he would, she would still be a woman. She would just have some differences in certain subsystems. Females tend to have XX chromosomes, but that second X doesn't really do much. It tends to just shrivel up, and only about 15% of it is actually expressed at any given time. And whether it's the first or the second X totally varies from cell to cell. You could literally have two cells right next to each other, one of them expressing the- I'm going to speed through some of this because it's just... I, I, I just think that, that just focusing on these details is basically irrelevant to the discussion. Nobody is considering gamete size when they're talking about biological sex. The first sex chromosome, the other one expressing the second sex chromosome. Ex except for you and maybe a few people in academia. That's not what human beings... That's what. That's not what the average person who's talking about biological sex means. Conversely, the Y chromosome mainly goes for male-specific biochemistry and functionality, things like the special ribosomes I talked about earlier, as well as things like sperm production. But remember, these genes can only be expressed under certain conditions and in certain parts of the body. So, like, for example, that sperm production gene is only ever going to be expressed in the testes. If I don't have testes because of one of the other genetic variations that we talked about a minute ago, this gene does nothing. Even if you have the gene, even if you have the whole chromosome, you could still be missing any one of five different pieces of the puzzle of what sex determination actually is. Oh, bye bye. Well, I mean, actually, depend. you know, talking of chromosomes and talking about this, on what basis can you say that DNA produces proteins? After all, you can have a base that doesn't fit properly in the ribosome and therefore you actually don't create a real protein right so we can speak about variations there too why make such a reductive definition of um of protein production you know what we we tend to call those things uh we, you know what we tend to call a production that has a defect in it oh yeah exactly that we, we call it defect drop my notes so, so like, why don't you just, why don't you just be consistent, especially you, somebody who, who seems to think, who seems to talk of brains and not of souls and spirits, and who seems to fit a part of the political spectrum that doesn't concede the existence of an immaterial mind. Why don't you be consistent? If you have these lower level subsystems that code for proteins, why can't you have higher subsystems that are dependent on those lower systems that also have purposes? Literally everything that I just said is completely reversed. It's it, in fact I, in fact I think that the whole human body screams that this this occurs. Like you wouldn't, like would this fella would you Forrest, uh, sincerely tell me that my lungs aren't there for breathing? Like, would you sincerely sit there and tell me that, um, you know, my heart, like doesn't beat so that it pumps blood around my body? Like, you can't deny the intrinsic telos in these higher level systems. So why deny it when it comes to sexual behavior, whether it be mental or physical? Birds. birds don't have XY, they have ZW, and it's the boys that are homogenous in the chromosomes. So they have ZZ, and the girls have ZW, and they have to go through the complicated back and forth gene pathway just as they girls. And don't even get me started on Daishas versus Manishas plants, man, because they're even weirder. There are lots of- We're not birds.
different species that don't have any differences in their sex chromosomes at all. They have totally different ways of establishing and differentiating their sexes. Like for example, there are lots of species of turtles and lizards and fish where sex is determined not by chromosomes, but by the temperature of their eggs. So you have a female leopard gecko. She lays her eggs in a cool shady spot. All of the babies are going to be female. But if she lays them in a warm sunny spot, all of the babies will be male. Unless it gets too warm and then they switch back over to female, but they're incredibly aggressive and we call those top females because herpetologists are not very imaginative. And it's really, really important to point out that when we're talking about these Cole Brunning asks, is it possible to be neither fe male nor female, as in the case of her of hermaphrodite, or would they be cons considered deficient male slash females? Well, that's that's the question. I would say that they can't partake in the efficient causality of sex. So I'd say that... Hmm. Well, I could be nice about it. I'll just say that. I... Like they aren't any less human. This is this is the thing that I think he's probably getting angry with. He, he he suspects that it's it's bigotry or something that's driving people to do this. And in some cases, it most certainly probably is. Right? There are probably people out there who hate trans people. There are probably people who are out there who hate those who embody a different gender. But I don't think that that's necessarily the case. And just because somebody has a defect or a deficiency doesn't make them any less human. You know, for example, I look at my finger, right? I have a mutation on my little finger that causes it to curve at a funny angle, right? This is, I think only 10% of the population has it. This is a defect, right? Am I any less human because of this? So why would somebody who is transgender be any less human, right? But would we say that this is something that acts in accordance with the rest of their biology? Of course not, because it doesn't. The mind is supposed to be there to, in this case, to properly direct towards sexual reproduction. Right? You, you don't have... You don't have sex without a brain, or without a mind. And that's going to be largely based on the nature of the person, um, you know, where that's going to go. These long genetic pathways, where any one step along the way could take us way off track. What we're talking about are variations, not anomalies, not deformities, not defects, variations. And there's a huge. So, so, so if we're talking about defects or abnormalities or or variations, right? But we would say this of other mutations. We, for example, right? I believe it's called the Hayflick limit, the the limit that controls the amount of um, cellular divisions that each cell can undergo before it dies, right? That mutating can cause defects that kill people. It's called cancer, right? Now, this doesn't mean that all defects are created equal, of course. This isn't my ins insinuation, although I'm sure that somebody's going to take me out of context here now I've said it. Like, there is clearly something wrong with me because I have my finger like this, but this doesn't mean that I have developed a serious defect because of it. But it's still nonetheless a defect. But it ranges. So... Like, we don't hate people because they have cancer, either. We don't. You don't hate me because I have a funny-shaped finger. Well, I mean, you probably hate me for my opinion. But, uh, you might hate me for my opinion anyway. But you don't hate me because I've got this little finger. So, why would anyone else, like, hate anybody for any particular defect? Huge difference. Over the years, I've studied in a lot of anatomy labs, and I've dissected a lot of human cadavers, as well as other animals, and we see variations all the time. Just differences from the textbook. Little changes in how an artery branches, or how a nerve passes through a muscle, or even big things like the shape or position of a whole organ. These are classified as variations and not deformities or anomalies because they happen a lot more often than you might think, and they don't really cause any harm. They're just relatively inconsequential differences between one person and another. And I would agree because it would still lead to them fulfilling the definition that I read earlier on about efficient causality in sex, in the sexual act. So my question is, is it really so hard to accept that things like sex or gender could be subject to the same kinds of variations, and that those variations would be, at most, equally inconsequential? This may shatter someone's whole worldview, but it needs to be said. Well, I mean... Actually, I'm going to repeat that. So I can just say One person or another. So my question is, is it really so hard to accept that things like sex or gender could be subject to the same kinds of variations, and that those variations would be, at most, equally inconsequential? This may shatter... Well, no, because there's a difference between an inconsequential change in, say, the direction of a vein or an artery, or a complete change of mind, and and a complete change of mind that draws somebody away from the way that their bio their subsystems are supposed to work. Right? Like male and female gametes combine to produce children. When it's placed in a different direction, it's not fulfilling that purpose. Like if you don't have at least some people performing that purpose, the human race dies out in 110 years. Like, this is obviously very relevant. Unless you want to you say that somehow human survival is completely irrelevant. 
shatter someone's whole worldview, but it needs to be said. In fact, if you take nothing else away from this video, I hope you understand this one point. An X or a Y chromosome is neither necessary nor is it sufficient for determining your sexual identity. There is... Well, I, I am, I'm under no illusions. I'm going to probably change nobody's mind. I'm probably just going to wind people up. But I do, at the very least, hope that people who are of the camp that are in favour of gender ideology might actually try to consider these things in a more philosophical way. Right? Not, not in the philosophy that would reject something like, like norms, but rather from a more a more grounded perspective, perhaps. One that considers the natures of things. That would be that would be nice, although I doubt that I'll fulfill that either. Is no standard template for male versus female development in biology. And unless you have had your well, I mean, yes there there literally is though, right? Because as I've just stated, there is efficient causality involved in the sexual act, and the majority of human beings are one or the other, right? And the ones that aren't are either personally, are per either personally disposed in a different direction, either because they're born that way, as he will try to prove later on, or because of habituation, or there's something that's going wrong in other systems beyond their control. So there is actually a standard template, it's just that there are slight slight variations and sometimes uh, variations that rob the human body of the ability to properly act out the telos of all of its subsystems. Your DNA sequence and analyzed by a developmental biologist, you have no idea what's going on with you in this respect. As it stands, there are... Well, I mean, I do. Uh, I know that I'm male. I know that I'm, I'm, I'm a heterosexual man. I, I know. <laughs> More than enough variations on the sex chromosomes alone to make a male that is feminine enough or a female that is masculine enough to pass as the opposite gender. I don't need someone to look at my gametes down a microscope to know that I like women. <laughs> in both social circles and even to themselves, the language of genetics is in no way laconic or easy to decipher, and that makes it completely impossible to reduce things like sex and gender down to a binary. Gametes can be gendered in this way. Brains and bodies cannot. The point that I'm trying to make is... Yes, they can, right? In fact, that's been my entire point, right? Gametes can be gendered this way. The body that somehow, like, provides the ability for the, g the gametes to function properly can't and the brain that directs the human being towards the act does that isn't what who, who does he think that we are right it, uh, has he has he considered that the gametes won't even work if we don't have directions in this way if i'm not attracted to a woman then i'm in no way uh, mentally inclined to fulfill the the purpose of those lower systems right what's the point of me having gametes that with an egg eventually form a child Right in the womb of a woman. If I'm not attracted, what's the point? It completely, it, it completely runs in the face of, you know, the, the whole species surviving. Make here is that even what you might call normal is a massively diverse group of people. We all live on a spectrum, and people are under no obligation to make sense to you. The other point that I'm trying to make is that we really need to stop saying things like XX equals girl. At most, we need to be saying things like people with XX are typically girls. We need to do away with all this unnecessarily heteronormative language if we're going to ameliorate the way that our society perceives and treats gender as a whole. But to really understand what I mean by that, let's try to define gender. Gender is a fluid term and a social construct. And if you don't believe me on that, just think about this with me for a second. Can a real man... It, it's not as bad as... It's not as bad as you think. I mean, in a way it is. Because he's going to later on say that it flows from sex, right? Which is true. But he's also going to talk about society imposing things, but he forgets that... At least in the sense of social relations, society flows from human nature too. So there's a kind of an intrinsic biological relation between gender, between gender expression in society, and intrinsic biological nature. How could it be any other way? We choose with a will that is intrinsic to our nature, we think with a mind that is intrinsic to our nature, and we act with organs that are intrinsic to our nature. Be it our arms, our fingers, our legs, or any other organ. We act with our our human nature and that's what leads to societies so to try and disconnect society and say society is this oppressive force nonsense it's only oppressive insofar as the human nature as is lived out by the people that individuate it it is only defective insofar as those people aren't fulfilling the last end of man Wear a dress? Can a real woman fix a car? What about ordering a fruity cocktail? Who gets to do that? What about the There are certain behaviours that lend each gender, as you say, towards these things. Men are more inclined towards tools. This is just a fact. Now, I could make some sort of pseudo or quasi-historical point about being out in, um, you know, being hunter-gatherers, right? 
But the fact of the matter is, is that men are typically more inclined towards tools. Being the primary breadwinner of a house, who, whose job is that? When you think about it for more than two seconds, you start to realize that the way that we define gender is completely arbitrary, and it varies from generation to generation. The only reason that it's arbitrary is because we live in a society that makes these real, innate biological differences largely irrelevant. Most people in Western society work inside an office. You don't need these intrinsic biological differences to make that much of a difference in an office, in itself. It will make differences in things like social interaction, and that's probably why there are more men who are CEOs than women. But to say that it makes as much difference as, say, during the Middle Ages, I'm not sure. Generation, if not from person to person. I mean, consider the fact that our traditional nursery colors of blue for boys and pink for girls was only really established in the 1940s. Before that, dressing up boy and pink would have been all the rage. But now, if you ask most people, they say dressing up boy and pink is like somehow obscene. The truth is that masculine and feminine really don't mean anything in concrete terms. Certainly not in biological terms. Gender is just the term that we use for how an individual organism expresses their sexual identity in a cultural context. It is a reflection of that individual's expectations and the society. And the culture is biological too. Society's expectations of their behavior. And just to really drive that point home, let's take a look at a few examples to show just how fuzzy gender really is. We talked a little bit about sexual dimorphism. There are some species where the males are bigger and stronger than the females. There are also some species. Who cares? Right? Like, like forest. These, these other creatures do not have sophisticated societies in the way that we do. You have large ant colonies, you have colonies of chimpanzees and bonobos or whatever, but they aren't human beings. A monkey cannot sit and read Aristotle. Where the females are bigger and stronger than the males, and then there are a lot more species that are not dimorphic at all, and so the males and females are completely indistinguishable from one another. There are also plenty of species that have three or more genders or no genders at all. There are even some species where the males take multiple forms, some of those forms resemble females. There are other species like hyenas, where the females are so indistinguishable from the males that it's really hard to tell the difference without like, dissecting them because the females have a fully erectile pseudopenis. There yeah, actually, the, um, for those who are interested in, um, in, in early Christian history, the Epistle of Barnabas actually talks about this. Fruit bats in Borneo and Malaysia, where the males lactate to feed the babies, and even human males have mammary glands that can be triggered to develop and even produce milk in the right circumstances, no matter what your chromosomes look like. There are lots of species where the males impregnate the females and the females give birth. There are other species where the females deposit eggs inside the male and then the male gives birth. There are some species where the males, not the females, tend to the nest and watch over the eggs. There are other And guess what? We're human. Species where they take turns. There are lots and lots of species that are patriarchal and the males control the group. There are lots and lots of other species that are matriarchal and the females control the group. A lot of primate species, even some of our closest relatives, are Okay, like riddle me this then. Should those should those species that have patriarchal structures suddenly become matriarchal? Why? Why, why not? I mean, if we're, if we're discussing as human beings that have our own biological makeup as a species and we are inclined in a certain way, then if we're discussing, oh, maybe we should restru restructure society because different species should, why don't we force that on other species? Why don't we make dogs change their way of behaving? Why don't we make fruit flies? I mean, if we're going to do it with us, why not? are matriarchal, not patriarchal. In fact, there are several species where being a big, strong, dominant alpha male would be no female ever mates with you. And as I said- Anissa Demas says, I am a monkey who can read Aristotle. You're also one that can type as well. Tell me when you're done with Shakespeare. In the beginning of this video, humans are not special in any of this. We are just animals. The one cool thing that we've got going on for us is that we are the only animals that communicate in great detail how it feels to have a gender. We should not be afraid of these differences between cis and trans and gay and straight or whatever. We should be excited for an opportunity to learn how life really works rather than just trying to cram everything down into boxes all the time. If we want to understand- Okay, I mean. I mean, like, I'm not exactly somebody who's particularly biologically curious, and I don't think I ever will, because it just doesn't interest me. But nobody is saying we should just ignore these identities. We should acknowledge where we have difference and make accommodation for that when pursuing our final end, which is happiness, which is held in possession, in possession of the truth. Not the subordinate truths that are discovered by science, but the truth from which all other tru truths flow. And what it means to be anything. We need to focus on science and be listening to the people who are living the lives that we want to understand. And speaking of understanding, let's take a minute to talk about brains. Now, I don't have time in this video to get into like the whole anatomy and physiology of how brains work, so I'm gonna skip all that, and I'm just gonna say that there are, in fact, small structural differences between the brains of male and female humans. In other animals, these differences are big enough to be seen with the naked eye, but in humans, it's really they're quite subtle. We're talking about clusters of neurons that are like the size of the grain of rice. These That's actually quite a lot. But... There are differences that develop within a few weeks before birth to maybe a couple of years after birth. The major notable brain regions that are usually talked about in research papers on this type of thing are the sexually dimorphic nucleus of the preoptic area, the central subdivision of the bed nucleus of the striatum analis, and the vasoactive intestinal polypeptide containing subnucleus of the suprachiasmic nucleus. Yeah, try saying that three times fast. And here's a fun fact for you trans people have been consistently shown to have neural architecture in these areas that matches their gender identity, not their genitalia. So, for example, the BSTC is about 50%. So, why do we prefer the brain to anything else? I mean, if you're going to sit there and tell me we're just, you know, if we, if we assume a materialist, physicalist, rather, point of view where everything is matter, what particular reason is there to prefer the brains of the genitals? Now, I can provide a reason why. I would say that the 
intellective and um, volitional faculties of the human person are objectively higher in being. But I don't think that you can make that point because they're all matter, after all. So, why? And actually, actually, that's... I've never heard anybody answer that. I suspect there's probably an answer out there, but it'd be interesting to hear. Percent larger in men than it is in women. A trans man, so someone transitioning from female to male, has a BSTC. Oh, there's a bunch of comments. Yeah, the b bonobos who are matriarchal of Wailo... Oof. <laughs> Oof. Cole Bruning says, isn't cramming things into boxes kind of the point of biological taxon? <laughs> yes, it actually is. <laughs> Species is a kind. There's, there's genera and differentia, yeah. You've got your categories and then they're differentiated by different categories. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Oh no. C that is the size of a cis man. And similarly, a trans woman has a BSTC that is the size of a cis woman. These are structural differences that cannot be accounted for with any amount of sexual reassignment surgery. So what? Why should I prefer one to another? Like, th like this, this is the problem, right? You as a biologist, you're there to describe the biological reality of things. You're there to describe, uh, you know, differences between human people. You're not there to say what we ought to do in light of those things. That's, for, that's a job for somebody who is trained in ethics. So, why are we bringing this up? ...or any amount of hormone therapy. This is literally having a female brain trapped inside a male body or vice versa from birth. Incidentally, in homosexuals, that same region of the BSTC is the perfect size for their gender. Sexual orientation and gender are two entirely different things. However, interestingly enough, the VIP SCN is actually more dimorphic. So it's smaller in females and larger in males, but in gay males, it's even larger. So it's like, they're more masculine in this way. So that's kind of cool. And speaking of homosexuality, there's clear evidence that there's a big genetic component to that as well. Back in the 1990s, there were several studies that were done that showed that if one identical twin was gay, there was up to a 65% chance that the other identical twin would be gay. But that only works in identical twins because they share the same DNA. In fraternal twins with different DNA, the chance of the other one being gay went down to around like 29% max. And in non-twin siblings, the chance went down to just the normal average for any average American, which is about 4%. All of this pretty much categorically rules out the idea that somebody can be turned gay or worse, straightened out. But it does Actually, it doesn't, because all you've done is you've described a subset of gays where that's the case. You haven't categorically ruled out that homosexuality could be habituated. So, no, your, your argument doesn't actually prove anything. It says, that at most, it proves that there is a subset of gays that this can't be done to. It does not rule out the idea that there could be environmental factors that cause epigenetic changes that allow those genes to be expressed. These studies are super important, but they lack a lot of context, and that context can only come from people being incredibly honest with total strangers about very intimate sexual details that, at the time these studies were done, were very taboo. Personally, I think that if we were to run those same studies again today, with our society that's a lot more open and accepting homosexuality, and we were to factor in things like the religiosity of the person's upbringing and how accepting their family is, we would find that things like homosexuality, or at least bisexuality, are a lot more common than you might think. But that's just a supposition, so let's get back to science and wrap things up. So if you've been following along, we've covered that there are at least three different areas of the brain that are dimorphic between the sexes, and they each vary independently of one another. So that means you have two different possibilities in three different regions. Yeah, you have different subsystems. So 2 times 2 times 2 is 8 different ways that your brain could be structured between what you might call just male or just female. If you factor in what kind of gonads you have, either testes or ovaries, that's another times 2. But you could also have neither and you could also have both, so we really should be saying times 4, but just for convenience sake, we'll say another times 2. So that means that you have at least 16 different configurations of what you could presumably call someone's gender. And we haven't even factored in- Or we could just consider all of these gen all these different characteristics in aggregate. You know, a a form of forms, so, so to speak. I've forgotten the exact technical term that's used for it, but you can have a form that is composed of other forms underneath it. There's no reason why we have to reduce sex down to a single characteristic. In sexual orientation, you would have to make different permutations for gay, for straight, for bisexual, for pansexual, for asexual. We haven't factored in intersex people. We haven't factored in Kleinfelter syndrome, where you have XXY, that's three sex chromosomes. We haven't factored in Turner syndrome, where you have X and then nothing else. We haven't factored in whether you have a penis or a vagina, or both, or neither, or more than one of one or the other, which happens from time. You see, and this is why this would have been a much more interesting conversation if he was philosophically trained, because this is completely missing the point. The time. If you really, really want to push the idea that everybody fits into just one out of however many boxes, you are very quickly going to have to come up with dozens, if not hundreds, of different categories just to fit this insanely parochial world. I mean, to be fair, that's that's literally what gender ideology does online. You have hundreds of genders. World you're keeping. It is so much easier just to say that things like sex and gender and sexual orientation exist on a spectrum. And while it is entirely possible that you're like 100%... And the spectrum is obviously going to be grounded in reality because it's describing something biological that's objective there. Right? straight or 100% female it's also at least equally possible that you land somewhere along this fuzzy rate or we could just use my definition and none of these things are relevant because it's about the efficient causality in the act and again I'm you could probably make three categories based on what i have i've got male female and those who are incapable right there's there's three categories Unless you have had your brain scan and your genome sequenced you have no idea where you land on this deeply ramified line at this very moment and that no i know i'm male i know i'm male uh, i don't i don't need 
any sort of sequencing to know that. Shouldn't bother you. It should make you curious. But to go on telling people things like you're XY and that means you're a boy and boys act like this is not only preposterously inaccurate, it is cruel and dangerous. Which brings me to why I care. As someone who is cisgendered and at least mostly straight, you can argue that I don't have a dog in this fight. But the fact of the matter is, I am a scientist and an educator. I care about the truth. I care about human beings. And I especially care about the next generation. Suicide is- Who doesn't care about truth? Like, really, we all seek the good. And the highest good is truth. Like, the only people who don't care about truth is when they see something better that isn't true. It is the second leading cause of death among people from the ages of 10 to 24. Lots of young people think about it. I thought about it at that time. But LGBT people in that age group are almost five times as likely to have attempted suicide than their heterosexual peers. And what's worse, LGBT youth who are coming from non-accepting and non-supportive families are eight times more likely than the other LGBT youth to have attempted suicide. So we're talking about eight times more likely than the people who are already five times more likely than the people who are already stressed the hell out to try to kill themselves. And all of this is hugely exacerbated by the fact that you have idiots on TV and on the internet saying, aha, this high suicide rate proves that this is all a mental disorder. No, it proves that these poor kids are being treated like perverts and freaks for just trying to exist. It well, actually, it only says that for maybe, maybe that subset there. It could, like, it could be possible that the eight, the, 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 the group that has the higher level is actually because they sincerely hold their religious views and they don't want to act on those things that they can't help. And that's what's stressing them out. It could just be that. It could be that like, maybe they don't want to be able to do these things, but they're still nonetheless harassed by those thoughts. Have you considered that? If the biggest problem that you're... Like, this, this here in itself doesn't really prove anything. It could be as uh, the, the people that you've just described as idiots. Uh, they, could, they could have a point. It could be your view. But the mere fact that they want to commit suicide more in itself doesn't prove anything. Because there are multiple reasons why uh, LGBTQ youth might want to kill themselves. Right? They might be in a nastier socioeconomic situation. It could be because of, you know, like you say, rates of depression because they're oppressed. It could be as a result of the actions that they're made to carry out. It could be a result of many things. But you haven't established that and therefore you can't make that conclusion you're having in the 21st century is what people's genitals look like and what they're doing with their genitals in the company of other consenting adults. If, if, if that is the needle on your moral compass, I strongly encourage you to reevaluate your priorities. In fact, actually, I would tell you to reconsider that because sex is one of those things, as I'm sure you well know, that drives people insane, right? You, people ruin their lives. Incels, as I'm sure you've heard. These are people who ruin their lives in the pursuit of, in the pursuit of well, basically because of sex, not even necessarily because of the pursuit of sex. But sex is an incredibly powerful force, as I am sure that you, Forrest, are very well aware. And that changes the habits of people, and it completely changes their worldview. Now, I live in a so society surrounded by people who are influenced by these things. And that necessarily changes what they think and what they do. Why would I not be concerned about how they're using their genitals? If it's going to have such a tremendous impact on the temperament and habits of the people around me, why would I not care? Even, like, and this is just from a purely selfish perspective. This is assuming that, um, this is assuming that I don't feel charity for the people around me who are suffering because of this. In any case, I, I think that this idea that sex should just be ignored and pretended um, as if it's, like, completely irrelevant, no. That's the destruction of society right there, because that's the one thing keeping the society going. If you don't have kids or new people, the society crumbles. And that's just on the basis of reproduction. That's before we get into things like how it changes a person's opinion of themselves, whether they hate themselves or they become arrogant because they indulge very much in sex. This is before we consider the influence on the prudence of a particular person. This is before we consider how much it dulls the senses of a person. You know, for example, I'm sure it the school that you went to, Forrest, or really anybody who's watching, there were fights over girls. And that's because of that sexual instinct. Of course I care, and I think that it's a really silly thing not to care. And maybe you still don't believe me. Maybe you think that I've just got something totally wrong, or that I misinterpreted the data. That's fine. I'm an evolutionary... Okay, so Cole Bruning says, Sex is a cluster property whose attributes are unified by their biological function. Yeah, but there's like a specific term that's used by... um. By Dun Scotus. Oh, I'm trying to think of it, and I can't remember it off the top of my head. I'm biologist, and I mainly study bioanthropology. I am not a geneticist, I am not a developmental biologist. So I would hit the limit of my understanding in this topic well before I hit the limit of what there is to be understood. But I should point out that even considering that, I have not even scratched the surface of what I could have talked about here. 
But all that being said, as a scientist and an educator, it is my job to cite my sources. So here's a list of some of the books and the studies and the peer-reviewed scientific papers that I use to make this video. He gives 233 different papers. But, I mean, I don't think that's very relevant. And the reason why is because there are sources who run contrary to him that have not only got, like, who have thousands of years of peer review. You know, you could have peer review for all of these papers with a few thousand people. Whereas the sources that oppose his particular ideology, they have been peer-reviewed down thousands of years by billions of people. So, sigh away. But that doesn't change the fact that intelligent people throughout the ages, who were not ignorant of sex, made different decisions and came to different conclusions than you. And so we'll bring it to a close there, I think, uh, this video. We will, um, I'll tell you what, if anybody's got any questions, stick them in the chat. I will, um, I'll answer them while I'm here. I'd also kind of like to know what people thought. Did I bring water in the room? I don't think I did. That's annoying. Uh, uh, please tell me if I was a little bit unpleasant or harsh in this. I might take it down. I might not. I'm not decided. Um, but yeah, I'll answer any questions anybody has. Oh, well, at least we retained a decent number of views. Like, we re retained the viewers at around 10, as they were before, which is quite nice. Um, let's see. Okay, I've just seen True Chad Waifu has sent me something. Okay, let's see if the chat has anything to say. Ivan Spazino says, Good evening, Hail Mary. Truth and Downfall says, no, you weren't harsh. Okay, I'm trying to think from the perspective of a person who believes in gender ideology watching this. Because I understand that these types of people tend to be... I mean, this is a very sensitive area. And the way that I've spoken about this uh, might end up making them irritated. And the reason... This is, this is something important to consider, I think, uh, with people of this. Because understanding what what anger is is important to this because anger is what occurs when someone oversteps their bounds and when someone touches somebody's identity that's a great overstepping of bounds and that's why you see so much anger over these things that's from their point of view from our from our point of view those who are who are against this it's because we think of this as a um as something that ultimately well, not only does it destroy the lives of the people who are indulged in it it also destroys the lives of the society because, as I've stated, the sexual views and sexual behaviours of anybody in the society has a necessary cascading effect on everyone else. Anissa Demas, thoughts on Buddhism? I don't actually have any. Um, I haven't studied that, so um, I don't really, I don't really have any particular opinion. All right, I'll take that as the only question. I'm going to give it ten more seconds, and then we'll close it up. Okay. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Okay. I'll take it that everyone has done their questions then. And in that case, we will bring the stream to a close. Thanks everyone for watching, and I will see you guys later. Bye bye.